George, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm really excited to get to hear your story today. And, and I know that that our our listeners will as well, and they're, they're going to absolutely love it. And listeners, I'd love to encourage you guys to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any great episodes. And I'd also love it if you could rate and review the show just to, to get the word out to, to highlight the amazing guests that that have, have agreed to share their time today, such as such as George. And, and so uh, we're going get to get to hear his story and, and truly, truly is really, really cool and, and a, an amazing background. But uh, George, I don't know how that's an intro for you, but I'd love to hear your story. And I'd love to, for you to kind of take us through the how you got started in the game of baseball. Well, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for, for having me. I'm very grateful to be here. And, and it's a privilege to share my story. And I guess this is one of those things that the this pandemic has brought us where I've had a little extra time and I've always wanted to share my story. I think we all have these um, just unbelievable stories. They're all very unique and they, they stem from the experiences we've had in our life. Um, I like to start the story by just asking the, the simple question uh, to take a minute for, to think about the most impactful person that you've had in your life. The person that, has made the greatest difference in your life. And I like to think of this person as could get you to run through a wall for them. This person helps you be the, the best version of yourself. Um, this person cares about you. This person listens to you, but also hears you. And this person loves you. So when I, I think of that person, it's pretty simple for me. And I go straight to my mom, it was, it was my mother. So um, to understand my story, kind of where I came from and, um, you know, how I was molded and, and grew up and raised, I think it's very important to understand my mom and what she stood for and, and her background. See, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in this traditional family. Um, my parents were never married, a biracial family, white mother from this Northeastern little town outside of Boston. And then they had a house in, in Cape Cod as well. So my mom was one of seven kids. And then here you have my dad, a very dark skinned black man from South Georgia, one of six, and uh, you know, barely made it through high school, very poor, and completely two opposite ends of the spectrum. And I, I just thought I had the best of both worlds. So I had a, an older brother, just a year older than me and a younger sister. And uh, it's amazing. We had two, two loving parents, but there was nothing normal about it. Um, I think of these things my mom would do for us, these exercises, and we would, you know, at a young age, we'd finish dinner and, and here it is. My mom would pass out our diaries. She handmade these diaries for us. And, and we'd have to write something positive about that day or the day before. And then we have to exchange diaries and then write something positive about your brother, about your sister. And we just kind of rotate and then we have to get up and read it in front of, uh, in front of all of us. So I have, I have a 14 year old and a 12 year old and, you know, trying to get kids to do a, a homework assignment from the parents and then also trying to get them to say something positive about a sibling is, is not an easy task, but I, I, I realize the value in it and, and uh, how my mom just thought it was very progressive mindset and, always thinking of trying to get us to think of something positive and, and take away some good. So what, what I learned though, is no matter how difficult the times are and, and how tough things are, we can always think of something positive. We can always draw something good out of the difficult moments. And that's how we learn. That's how we get better. But what jumps to my mind when I was, when I was writing this down on paper the other day, as I think of this pandemic where, you know, there's, this will arguably be the, the most difficult time for most of our, our generation. And there's so much good that's happening uh, during this time. Um, the, the family dinners, these exercises that my mom did with me, and I'm doing it with my kids. And like I said, my boys are 14 and 12 and, and we're having these long dinners and sitting there talking about things and, and just being able to have these, you know, good, good times and, and working out together. I'm able to talk to my father, uh, my godparents. Um, but it's been, it's been an amazing, I guess, six or seven weeks 
um, being at home with the family. So I also think of my mom had this uh, extremely feisty side to her. She knew what she believed in and what she stood for. And, you know, I, I, I think of the neighborhood we grew up in in Southeast Atlanta off of Lakewood Freeway. Uh, it wasn't the best neighborhood, but we enjoyed it and it's what we knew. But uh, it was that neighborhood, if, if you left something out that had any value to it, there's a decent chance it could be stolen that next morning. And uh, I mean, I, our driveway was almost, it was almost like a dead end street. Two roads came together and it's at the bottom of a hill. And here, here's my brother, leaves his bike out and it gets stolen. So we knew this group of thugs that, that did it. And, and uh, my brother and I were scared to death. There's no way we're gonna approach these, these kids. They're older than us. And, and here's our mom. And this is that little crazy side, this crazy white woman approaches these guys. And I, and I like to describe them as like a, a pack of dogs when you have this one aggressive dog. And before you know it, you have two aggressive dogs and one's kind of biting at your pant leg. And before you know it, you got three, four, five, six dogs all coming at you and you know where to run. So here's my mom walks right up to him, grabs the bike, cusses him out. And just teaches us to stand up for what we believe and, and, and teaches them what's right and wrong. And they need to earn things in life instead of, you know, just taking stuff from people. So um, she, there was a, there's a method to her madness and a very special person. And she's always looking to make a difference in someone's life. Um, maybe one of the, the more impactful things that she did was getting involved in the civil rights movement. So I was born in 75 and, you know, there were some difficult times and fighting for equal rights, but here she is. The majority of our siblings went to Harvard and my mom chose to go to Smith. So she never took the easy road or the road that was paved for her, but she wanted to make a difference. So she jumps in, uh, in a car with a couple of students and heads south. And that's what took her to Atlanta where we were raised. But she spends time in Atlanta and Selma and uh, Montgomery protesting. She marches alongside Martin Luther King and, and Mayor Andy Young and became really good friends with uh, some of the, the big leaders during the civil rights movement. She was an artist, so she would print um, silt screening and, and posters that people would march with. She ends up going to jail probably seven to 10 times at spending up to two weeks in jail at time. And, you know, I, I later learned that she was just, you know, a phone call away from calling my grandfather to, to shorten that sentence and, and get her out. But she wanted to suffer the same pain that everyone else did and, and fighting for this cause. And I find it interesting. My brother's a lawyer and was able to pull her FBI file and and here it is, a, a, almost a 300 page file where they had surveillance on her and every move she made and phones were tapped at these times. And, you know, just being this huge activist, but to read the language, you know, white woman, daughter of Harvard professor hanging out with four niggers. And it, I mean, it's the language is unbelievable to read this and learn from it and, and shows you how difficult the times were and, and how she was so courageous to, to do the things she did. Um, and then I think there's, there's this moment, uh, where everyone, we all have these events in our life that, that change our life forever. And I can remember 1985 when I was in Cape Cod at my grandfather's house. And the, this is that place where we'd have some of the best memories I've ever had, you know, fishing and being in the water. We actually had sailing classes and doing things that, you know, kids would dream of doing. And I remember my grandmother calling us into the kitchen and, and telling us there's been a terrible accident. There was a car accident where the car hit on my mom's side and she had some severe brain damage and it didn't look like she was going to survive. So we, I mean, you talk about a life changing event. And I keep looking over that door and waiting on my mom to walk through with this huge smile and, and asking how my day was. And, you know, we're going to wait on my bedtime story and, you know, this big hug and a kiss and it, it just wasn't happening. And then, you know, my brother's 11 years old. I'm, I'm 10 years old. My sister's seven. And here it is, the one person that raised us and, and did all these things that we could 
you know, being around her, we could trust her and we could tell her anything. And, and she just loved on us more and she's gone. So it, it changed our life, changed our life forever. It brought us closer together. Um, you know, I always thought of my brother as a hero, but this took it to a new level. Now my brother's doing homework with me and he's, you know, he's being part-time dad, part-time mom. And, you know, he's paying bills at, at a young age. We're doing things that kids our age usually don't have to do. And this gave my dad a chance to be the dad we always knew he could be. He moves in with us and, and does the best job that he knows how. And, and then you think of my sister at seven years old, um, you know, with no female in the house, you got two brothers and a, and a father doesn't know the first thing about raising a little girl. So we got a chance to help raise our sister and, and just kind of be around each other and love each other more. And this is, I think, where my life kind of took off in sports. I mean, I had a lot of people that kind of made a difference in my life and helped me out, but it was that the one thing I could do that, that took the pain away for a couple hours and got me distracted and about the loss of my mom. And, and I could just be out there competing and, and in football, I could try and knock somebody's head off and, and baseball and get some hits and make a play. And I did every sport you can imagine. And, and I just, it took the pain away, but I can, I also remember the people that made a difference in my life. And I think of uh, Sutton middle school, and Miss Beavers, my my homeroom teacher, my social studies teacher, she would she would listen to me. She would just talk with me, and I could I could express anything to her. And my my PE coach in middle school, who got me over to the Lovett School to you know on a scholarship to uh, to play football and baseball, and it was a huge difference in my life. What the Lovett School did for me, and I think of my guidance counselor, Carolyn Jordan, was like a second mom to me. I mean, there are difficult times where I didn't have a ride to school and my guidance counselor was like, I got it. Just move in with us. You know, she, we were, you know, an extra kid for them. My, my sister and I lived with her. She gave us a car for a few months to help us out. And then I think of people like Bill Rayleigh. Bill Rayleigh was my high school football coach. Uh, he was a coach to me. He taught me how to be tough, taught me how to play football. He was a friend to me and he was, you know, a dad to me and Jim Glasser, one of the other football coaches. And I lived on the other side of town. I went to this great private school in Buckhead in Atlanta and I couldn't get to football practice and summer practice. And coach Glasser, I got an idea. Uh, give me your address. I'm gonna go pick you up. Jumps in his car 30 minutes later, comes to get me, takes me to practice, takes me home. I mean, these are the type of people that made a difference in my life that, Never knew my mom, but made an impact in my life, similar to what my mom did. So I continued to progress in sports and uh, eventually going into my senior year, I'm one of the top running backs in the country. I had a chance to go play anywhere. I, I narrowed down the University of Georgia, Notre Dame and Florida State. You know, I got Lou Holtz calling me and coming over to my house and Bobby Bowden and Coach Goff at Georgia. and. Some of these experiences I'd never change or never trade, you know, for my life. And I just really enjoyed it and eventually signed to go to the University of Georgia. And this is kind of before some of the ESPN press, press conferences. But I remember doing scholastic sports and announcing I'm going to University of Georgia. And if you think of football, when you sign to go to school, it's usually uh, like January, February. So I commit to go to Georgia, excited, one of the happier times in my life. And you fast forward to the end of my senior year, and now I've become a pretty good baseball prospect in the Atlanta Braves taking me in the second round. So now I got another decision to make. Do I go, go to college and play football and baseball, or do I turn pro and, and live this dream that you know, so many little kids uh, dream of doing? And I choose to come out and play baseball. Uh, had a chance to get my college paid for and a chance to uh, you know, help, help my dad out. So here it is. I head to, to West Palm Beach, Florida, and got a whole new set of obstacles coming my way. Like here's this raw athlete that hadn't played much baseball and starting in the professional world. And I kind of get my ass handed to me and hit a, a buck 42 and, and just kind of, you know, grind it out and keep grinding. And I just think of all the coaches that made a difference in my life. 
I think of, uh, you know, one coach that jumps to mind, Chido Karahia, who's in the Kansas organization now. This big Cuban guy, like a big teddy bear, but he would just listen to me. I was 0 for 4, three punch outs, kind of picked me up off the floor and talked to me and and reestablished that I can still play in this game and you know, that trust and that belief in me. And sometimes I didn't believe in myself. And and then those four for fours, he was right there smiling with me, still just keeping me level headed and you know, the difference he made in my life. And I spoke with Chino last week and just grateful for the things that, that he did. You know, this is over, I would say, 25 years ago. Um, Leon Roberts, Redbone, you know, lived in Texas, was our hitting coach. I can remember being in Macon, Georgia. You know, we're in the middle of summer. It's a 100 degrees outside. And here we are in an outdoor cage. We sat a, a, a train track. He's flipping to me at 10 in the morning for a seven o'clock game. You know, the, the amount of work that some of these guys did and you with your baseball background, you, you get the grind, you understand it and the love you have for these guys. So I end up playing for 16 years with, uh, with, with uh, parts of six years in the major leagues. And I, I, it was, I don't regret it for anything. I had a chance to play college football and, I loved every minute of it, and I, I embraced the grind and the back and forth, and I understand all the people that made a difference in my life. You know, year 15, 16 of my professional career, I, I thought I was pretty cool if I got a chance to, to help out some of these younger guys enter the game and make a difference in their life like some of these coaches did for me. So my first coaching job after I finished playing was with the Boston Red Sox, and I got to be a hitting coach. Then I got to manage for two years, and then I became the outfield base running coordinator. So uh, I loved every bit of the different roles. And hitting coach, you, you know, you're just trying to build these guys up, teach them to do it the right way, and it's, it's a struggle. I mean, some guys will struggle all year long hitting, and you just got to keep their, their mind right. So I believe everyone that works in baseball needs to be a hitting coach, at least for, for a few months, to, to embrace that grind. That's a different animal than managing being in charge of a, a group of young men and a, and a coaching staff was not something I envisioned doing. And I loved every minute of it. Like I had a chance to make a difference on the field, off the field and, and keep our coaching staff pushing in the right direction. And then my dream was, was to actually impact the game with outfield and base running. And that's what I did the final three years with the Red Sox before I moved on to Atlanta for maybe four months before I got the phone call from the Dodgers. And I, I, there's one thing I can't leave out of this story is I remember agreeing to be the first coach, first base coach with the, with the Dodgers. And I get off the phone with Farhan uh, agreeing to the contract. And 30 minutes later, I got a phone call from university of Phoenix saying I'd passed my last, uh, my last test and I have my college degree. So I get my first big league coaching job and my college degree at 40 years old. And uh, it's a hell of a week. It was, it was a hell of a week and a hell of a couple months. And um, I was, I mean, I was as excited to get that degree uh, as anything I did in baseball. So uh, I, I've pushed a couple of my players to go back and get their degree. And there's a group of us with the Red Sox and, and, uh, and Dodgers that all fought to get our college degrees at, later in life and not the traditional way. So I had, um, you know, I've been with the Dodgers four years now. We make the playoffs all four years, go to two World Series, and it was unbelievable to be a part of something special and came up short, but, you know, it's, it's part of it and uh, it's going to make us better. We're going to learn from it. Every year we've gotten better. We've had a better team year after year after year after year, and um, it's going to help us. Uh, to win a World Series. So it's been cool to make a difference in a life like a uh, Cody Bellinger, a uh, Jock Peterson, um, Justin Turner. You know, I, it's, it's an honor to, to be on the field with these guys and I love them and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there to help them be the best player they can possibly be. So my challenge for the listeners and for you, Jonathan, is to, to make a difference. We get this opportunity every day. You know, I lost my mom at 10 years old and the difference she made in so many lives at such a short lifespan was amazing. You know, it could be as simple as 
writing in a diary or standing up some, some, some thugs that just stole a bike or as powerful as being involved in a greater cause like the civil rights. But my mom made a difference and that's the way I live my life. And like I said, we get this opportunity every day. So thank, thank you for having me and let me share my story. Of course. I love it. And, and again, it's, it's so, it's so awesome to hear, you know, all the, all the different things that, that have made you, you. And, and obviously I think that that, that really makes uh, an impact on who, who we are today. You know, our past tells us, uh, tells us such a, such a powerful story on, on the things that we're doing on a daily basis today. And, and so I really appreciate you sharing all of that stuff with us because I think it's absolutely fantastic. And, and not that that stuff that happened to you was fantastic, but I, it just, it, it's, it's such a powerful story that, that I think that now that we know you and your background, now we can understand uh, just the, the different obstacles that, that you had to overcome. And it's just, it's, it, it, again, it's, it's an amazing story um, of who you are and, and the different things that you had to, to go through as a, as a young kid and, and to, you know, to, to get your degree and to be a big league coach. Now it's just, it's, it's really cool. And so, you know, something that, that I wanted to uh, talk about too, is, as you mentioned that you, the Dodgers culture is obviously special. And so you being in, in some different organizations and you being someone who truly pays attention to like the ins and outs uh, and especially the mindset of players with, uh, again, you're, you're obviously interested in psychology and you talked about all the different people who made an impact on you. Uh, so tell us about why the Dodgers culture is special. And then we can, we can kind of dig into how you are continuing to make a difference in your players every day. Cause, cause I, I want to set the set, set the tone of, okay, here's what the Dodgers do. And then here's what I do on a daily basis to serve my players. Uh-huh. Well, uh, great question. Um, first, before we even dig into this question, what makes the Dodgers special, they have very good players uh, for one. And uh, to have good teams, you need good players. Uh, but it goes much deeper than that. And I was asked this question yesterday by one of the Dodger coaches and, and I was speaking to some of the minor leaguers, but, um, and he asked me the difference, you know, coming up with Atlanta and being around Bobby Cox and his Hall of Fame manager. And, and I think of Dave Roberts, who, you know, will someday be a Hall of Fame manager if he continues in this game. But they allow you to be yourself. And um, they, they set the precedent of what we want to accomplish. Um, and we want to be the best players that we can possibly be, the best coaches we can possibly be, and allow you to go out there and, and focus on doing that. And, they try and eliminate all these distractions and you get this group of, of young men and you get this coaching staff that really cares about their players and all striving for this one goal. I love that. And I think that, so whenever you talk about allowing players uh, to be themselves, obviously within the context of the team, you know, I, and I think I know the answer to this too, but, but I think that, that, that it's something that's probably changed in the last 10 years. We went from, especially whenever you grew up, you had the authoritarian coach who was, would say what he meant and you listened to him and you're yes, sir. And you're no, sir. And to now we're shifting to a, a time in, and to where we're now, we're less transactional coaches and more transformational coaches. And I know that that's, that's turned, uh, that's turned over the last maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Uh, and that's a term that that's used a lot, but in your opinion, why does that make a difference? Like what, how does that help our team? How does that help our organization? And how does that make us better coaches? Well, it starts with trust. And I can think of, uh, I mean, I think I've done a lot of good things in this game and helped some players, but I've also made a ton of mistakes and that's how we learn from our, our mistakes. But I can remember um, at the major league level where I lost the trust of a player. And it's very difficult to get it back. And, you know, I kick myself all the time, like, God, how could I have handled that situation better? But um, getting guys to believe in you and, you know, you, they know you have your back and, 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 uh, and they're allowed to go out there and perform. And, and uh, like, like I said in this speech, when we think of that person, that you think of that person that can get you to run through a wall for them. And when you envision that, that's that's the mindset we want to have as a coach. We want this guy to believe in you so much that he would do this for you and he would do that for you. And and 
and, and not making it about you. We, we lose our, you, you're around Chris Woodward, uh, one of my close buddies who was, uh, was the third base coach for the Dodgers, moved on to Texas. But uh, he, he talks about, uh, you know, not having an ego. And, and I, I completely agree with them and, and some of the things that you preach to, to build this culture. Love that. And, and, and Woody is, man, he's, he's one of the best. Like you talk about running through a wall for somebody, uh, anytime he talks for more than a minute or two, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm going to run through a wall for, for him for sure. And so for, for you, you know, you're working with some of the best players in the world and, uh, you just mentioned no ego and having no ego. And, and sometimes, you know, the best in the world have some of that. And, and so it, it's, you have to use psychology, I'm sure. Uh, to navigate different conversations because, uh, you know, the game of baseball, and you, you know this even better than I do, it, it's a game of ups and downs. And we've got to be that steady influence. And so, again, you're working with the best in the world. So how, how, are you, how are you an asset for them? How do you gain that trust? How are you an advocate for them? And just kind of walk us through just some different things that you do to help ensure to the player that, Hey man, I've got your back. Listen, you can trust me. I'm here for you. What are some different things that you do for them? When I think of building trust for your players, the first thing that enters my mind is, is kind of rewinding my career and going into my second year in coaching. And you get a player like Mookie Betts who signs as an infielder and you get Blake Schweihart who signs as a catcher. So I get this, this amazing group of guys and you think this happens overnight and these guys that are run through a wall for you. And, and uh, you know, and I like to use the word consistency. You got to be consistent with them, show up. I remember just wanting to walk in that weight room every morning. So when those players walk by that hallway coming into the facility, they know that I'm there and I'm, I'm ready. And a lot of times you got to lie to yourself. You got to like, it's a difficult day. You're going through a, a ton of events that you got to overcome, but you have to find a way to post and be there for them. So, you know, I, I have this, I felt like instant trust of these players. But when I look back, this was trust that happened over five years. So now I get my first major league coaching job. And you just think like, I have never been so prepared for a job in my life. And then you take the job and you think you're going to have this instant trust. And I'm around Dave Roberts. You think you're going to have this instant trust with these players. I know that took time. Every year, Dave has done such a good job of helping to create this culture where the players buy in and uh and stand up for each other and and all fight for the same common goal and it's a very at the major league level it's a very very uh delicate uh place to be because you know sure. you're walking in i it wasn't like i came up in the dodger system i'm coming from an outside organization in fact most of us were coming from an outside organization uh we had pretty much all new coaching staff when we walked through those doors uh so these players like who was this guy you know um uh, can I trust him? I've, I've made it this far in my career without this guy. Do I need to believe in what he says? And uh, so that's just, it has to happen organically. I think there's exercises you can do to speed the process up, but it's going to take time. You mind sharing the exercises or just some, some different things that you do to, to try to, to promote that? Just, I mean, not digging deep into it, but team and team bonding experiences where you're out there and, and, and spending time together. You know, doing exercises where you ask about their family, where it's not just about baseball. Like, uh, you know, Dave can rattle off so many stats and not really stats, but, you know, information about a guy's, you know, family and, and, and understand that he cares about them. And it's not just about what's happening between the lines. I love that. And I think that, that he, he's gotten such a reputation of being a player's coach, which, uh, I mean, uh, obviously – is a is a positive for me and and a guy that that can connect with so many so many different people and and it's it's really cool to to just see it from the outside in and I'm I'm sure it's it's it is even better working with him every single day but whenever we're talking about uh, just some different preparation that you have before games so you're the first base coach and uh, you know this is something that I'm learning about as we speak because you know being being a, a an amateur coach and you're coaching first base it's like okay grab the gear tell them how many outs make sure you look for the signs and then as i'm digging more into it it's like man positioning is so important and you have to know the game plan you have to know all of these different things 
but just kind of walk us through some different things that help you to feel prepared uh, for the seven o'clock game or the seven o five game. So whenever you're out there, you're like, okay, we got this, we got this, we got this, and just kind of walk us through uh, your process of of being prepared for a game, and then we'll we'll talk about the game within the game. Uh-huh. Well, that's uh, yes. So um, just walking through like a, like a series. Day one is always your most difficult. That's that's when we have. Uh, and I could never do all the work by myself. We have an amazing, amazing uh, staff and, uh, and players and, and guys, I'm sorry, upstairs that help us with the information. So we think of all the analytical stuff and data as it's just information. And the more information we have, the better. Now, we need to filter that information to our players and, and know your players. Um, and I use the example as, as like a Chase Utley. I could give as much information as I have, I could give to him and he could absorb it, retain what he likes and then discard what he doesn't like. And you think of like uh, a, be- a belly with Bellinger and, you know, arguably the best player in baseball right now. Um, and, you know, there's certain information you want to feed him. You don't want to clutter his mind. He's such a raw and unbelievable gifted, talented player. Um, that you just want to give them kind of absolutes and, and, and things like that to, to help them play free and play natural. Um, so day one, we go in, we have our, I've done all my homework. I've been given uh, positioning from upstairs. So my, I pretty much go in and, and what Dino Ebel, the third base coach will go in and double check what we've been given. Like, do we agree with these alignments? And and usually uh, they're very consistent and very good, but there are times when like, well, how are we going to pitch this guy? Uh, because he really yanks on spin and he stays up the middle with, with change-ups and, and heaters. So, um, so we go in those advanced meetings, kind of discuss the teams we're playing and, and kind of make sure all our information matches up. And then following that meeting, we'll meet with the players and kind of and talk about how we're going to play that team. So trying to get them prepared the best we can uh, where we don't drag – the players don't like meetings. So – um, you want to keep it as simple as possible. And, you know, I'll have a group of base dealers and I'll like, listen, here, here are our four guys that we can take advantage of. And I, I kind of group these guys into the colors. We'll have a green guy, a yellow guy and a red guy. And, uh, green is always good for us. We can run on these guys and yellow, you know, if he's given us like these tips that we like, we can run on them. And then, uh, red, we'll probably shut down the running game. And, um, so the more prepared they are, um, I think of it as a player, like you want to know the information before you go out there. Say from a base running standpoint, if this guy has a tip and you go out there and it's now pitch three, and then you see that tip, and, oh, this is the guy that does that. And that may have been the one pitch you had to run on. So we want to have those little, uh, those tips before we go out there and, um, and just kind of helping our guys line up defensively and, and, um, uh, like we want to do all the grunt work as a coaching staff. We want them to go out there and play and, and kind of under, we want them to understand what these, where we think we're going to hit the ball and how we can take advantage of guys uh, as an offensive group. No doubt. And so let's say Justin Turner gets to first base. And so what's kind of your process behind what, what you're talking with them about? Because for me, it's like, okay, Make sure we get the signs. Make sure we know the outs. Make sure we know where the outfielders are. What's the situation? Just, just something simple like that for me. But I'd like to hear kind of how you walk guys through what to do whenever they get to first base. Because for me, I'm, I'm just assuming they know nothing. Like I know they're big leaguers and I know that, that they've been around the game a long, long time. So I, I was, I'm curious if, if your process is any different than that. Well, first of all, Justin Turner is an absolute baseball rat. And he, he's one of the guys that embraces the meetings and sure. he can take advantage of any knowledge that you give him. And, and uh, you, you know what I think makes him such a good player is he's been humbled in this game. I mean, he was DFA'd and then let go by a couple clubs and kind of figured it out later. So he got to the top and had to make some adjustments in his game. And now he's one of I feel like the most clutch players in baseball and just the absolute baseball, uh, baseball player. I think it was one of the, one of the greatest compliments you can, you can give a guy, but we'll, we'll talk. And I think there's no other time to, to really establish the culture you want to have. And I learned this from Brian Butterfield during, you know, the time you have in spring training, because you get to the major league level, 
during batting practice, you don't really run the bases unless there's specific guys you want to work with. Um, but you want this culture. And, and what I've learned is you want your, your, your veteran players and your best players to really buy in. Because once you have that, that group of, uh, of, of young players to buy in, it, it, everything else just falls in, in line. Like we would love for the players to police themselves. And I feel that's what, what, what uh, happens with the Dodgers and hold each other accountable. But um, for Justin, not the fastest guy, but if a guy's not paying attention to him and, or he's a, you know, I'll know plus counts for dirt ball counts. If it's a huge dirt ball guy, I, I, JT be heads up for it. And, you know, he's a college player. So he's learned a lot of these things at an early age, but, he'll read that ball right out of his hand and he's, he's gone before the ball even hits the dirt. But just for that little simple, like I try and simplify it. Like I don't um, like to say rules. Players don't like rules either. So your responsibility is the minute you get on first base, you got to know where that ball's at. I mean, are they doing, say you just beat out a, an infield single and the first baseman still has the ball and you get over, you got to know where the ball is at. And you start getting your lead or as he's throwing the ball back to the pitcher. And then I like for them to go into getting their signs. You know, I always approach them on their right side. So if there's anything we got to talk about, uh, I have the player's body in between me and the first baseman. Um, going over the situation. So then we'll go to your defense. Um, and defense can be anything from the, the, the type of pickoff move uh, that that pitcher has to the catcher. Does he have a great arm? Uh, is he like a Contreras that loves the back pick? Um, or, you know, do you have a, a Hayward in, in right field for the Cubs that can really get to the ball quickly and, and, and make a good throw? So understanding and, – and defense is more important now than ever with all the amount of shifts. So if you only got one guy on the left side of the field, on the infield, you got that uh, third baseman that's shifted over to short. You know, if that ball takes him up the middle and you hit second base, you just you get your head up and see if that pitcher's covering or that catcher's covering and you keep going. So trying to process all that information in, in a short period of time is important. And then lastly, we have a scoreboard. So those are kind of my four things I go by. The scoreboard will, will dictate everything we do on the field. You know, are we stealing in a, in a 10 to 2 ball game or not? You know, we have to shut down the running game. If we're down by three and uh, your run doesn't mean a whole bunch. you got to be smart. So we'll shorten up our leads. Um, two strikes on a hitter. We're looking at the score. Two strikes, very good chance this guy goes to his his strikeout pitch, and it's a good chance he could be in the dirt. So it's it's difficult to look for a ball in the dirt every pitch. Um, so we want to be able to point out those counts for them and, and help them, um, you know, through the process. For sure. And do you feel like – because this is something that I believe, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too – do you feel like base running is a, an extremely overlooked part of the game that can reap so much of so much more of a benefit when you're good at it? Oh yeah, like it's um, there's definitely some lost art. I mean, I think the the information we've got, the value of an out in the major leagues is like is unbelievable. So understanding when you want to be aggressive, when not to be aggressive. Um, the stolen base is an art that's kind of gone downhill and, and, and arguably, or at least understandably, um, you also need the right parts. You're always going to have one or two guys on a team that can run, you know, steal a few bases, but the more impactful is the type of base runners you want your, your players to be. You want to take a ball, take advantage of balls in the dirt, go the extra 90 feet, uh, go first to third on a guy. So I like to think of, I'm, I'm not worried about a guy making, the first or third out at third base if he has the correct process. So if, if we know we have a minus arm in right field who kind of sits back on balls and this guy does everything unbelievable and it's a, you know, this right fielder catches the ball, makes an accurate throw, that third baseman gets the tag down. And now we've relied on three things and you're out, bang, bang. We want to pat that guy in the ass and say, hey, way to be aggressive. Now, if this player – gets a you know a real sloppy secondary expects this guy to make a play he bobbles the ball then decides to go hard now he's thrown out and makes that first out over there that's not a smart play uh, just because we didn't go go about it with the right mindset sure I it's love very that. it's very it's it's also very very difficult to teach base running because it's one of those things where you have to you have to go at it full speed and when you're playing mm -hmm. 162 games you got to take care of your guys and keep them on the field 
so like I said, the, the mindset and, and getting your right guys to buy in. But I remember, uh, I mean, I remember when the Kansas City won the World Series, it, it felt like they stole a base every time they got on. And I think they had 14 stolen bases in that playoffs. And we had maybe 13 against um, two years ago in the playoffs. And um, so, it, you know, if, if the matchups are good, we're going to be aggressive and try and take advantage of it. If we don't like the matchup, then we're, we're still going to play smart. I love that. And so in your career, well, one thing that I, that I want to talk about since you're, since while we're at first, but I also know that you coached third base in your career, but with, with first base, you're, <laughs> you're always next to an umpire, right? So how does that, how does that relationship play into uh, just the, you know, just playing the game within the game, right? And, and how do you develop relationships with those guys to I'm not saying that, that they will ever give you a call, but, you know, we want them to be on our side as much as possible. So how does, does that, do you go into anything like that? Cause that's just like me oh, yeah. looking okay. from that. Okay. Just from like, um, let's say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at every pickoff move that that pitcher's made throughout the year. You're going to have some that will go, you know, 162 games and throw the first uh, five times or two times. Uh, and then you'll have some, you know, some of the starters might throw over the first 130 times. So every, every time we go into a series, I'll look at those, look at the guys they've picked off, the times they've thrown over. Uh, is it a balk move? Is it not? And if it's an extreme balk move, which I think every pitcher with a good move is, is a balk move pretty much. But, uh, you know, trying to let this guy, without doing his job, make him aware of that move. And, like, uh, so I'll talk to him in inning before he comes in the game. Hey, be heads up for this, you know. And you got to know the umpires. You got to get to know them, uh, know which guys you can talk with and have a conversation. Uh, most of them are, are absolutely great guys and, and, and doing their best to, to get the call right. Um, but it's, it's a difficult game and they're going to miss some. And just like uh, I'm not perfect, they're going to miss some calls. But, you know, and then they also have the, the conversations that have nothing to do with baseball and you're just out there talking about what they got into last night. <laughs> That's good stuff. And, and another, another thing, cause <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things, the interesting things that you get to do is you've coached third, you've been at first. So how does, how does that relationship work as a first base coach communicating to the third base coach? Because obviously there are things that happen within a game that he's looking to you to decide what he's trying to do. So what are some of those different situations that come up and then how do you communicate with that? Um, well, you just get to, it's almost like having, you know, as a player, a teammate, but Dino was one of the most highly respected third base coaches in the game. And, and, uh, I was around Chris Woodward. I was around Brian Butterfield, all, all these guys. And, uh, like I said, Dino's experience is off the charts. So I'm always picking his brain and, and, and you know, finding out things he likes to do. Uh, I think of Butterfield after, um, he goes, I, I George, I want to stay engaged as well. And, you know, a guy runs to the base, makes the first out of the inning. The infielders are all putting their arm up, one out, one out. Well, I'd look at that first base coach and put my hand up, one out. So we're on the same page. We got one out. All right, let's move on to the next play because I'm not going to get ambushed. So understanding what we like to do and little pointers and, and stuff that um, that Dino likes to do, we'll communicate with the players. And, um, you know, it's it's definitely an advantage to get, you know, a first and third base coach that, that, that are operating off, operating off the same system and, and able to communicate uh, ways to take advantage of plays. For sure. And, and then let's talk about um, in between innings too. So let's say um, that you're in the, in the dugout and you're having some different conversations with players. And again, with, without getting into the nuts and bolts of it, just kind of walk us through what that process is. What do you talk to the players about, uh, things that you're seeing? I mean, just, just kind of take us through whenever you're not coaching first base, what your role is within the dugout. So, I, yeah, I don't really get a break because once we go in the dugout, then I, I'm, I have the outfielders. Um, so, you know, you can't miss a pitch. Dino's the same way. When he's in the dugout, he's got the infielders. And I remember just some of the adjustments I made. I used to be at the far end of the dugout away from uh, Doc and, and Bob Guerin and, and, uh, and Dino. Um, and now I've shifted. last two years, I've shifted down. So it, the order we've kind of sat in, it goes Doc, Bob, Dino, then myself. And the reason I do that is so we're all on the same page. Sometimes if, if Doc doesn't like the defensive alignment, 
or, you know, he's trying to get my attention. I'm too far away. Now it's taken, you know, two pitches for that to happen. Um, and just being right, uh, you know, say, say this, uh, we're in the ninth inning, we got a no double situation. And um, I know that third baseman's on the line. I can get that outfitter in the gap because that ball's hit on the line uh, on the ground. I have, we have a body over there and I can kind of eliminate that ball uh, in the gap. And so just uh, when I'm in the dugout, it's, you know, we're always talking defense and making sure these guys line up in the, the correct, correct places. Um, and now in between the innings, before I run out, uh, we'll talk about little tips and, and things that I see and things that Dino sees and uh, trying to exploit that. Oh, that's fantastic. And you're obviously a guy that, that wears, wears many hats. And, and so obviously you've got to be uh, super organized and, and super in tune to what's going on because you work with outfielders, base running, you coach a base. And so you, you literally don't get a break during the, like during once the game starts, you're just on a full go the whole time. Mm -hmm. I think there's so many, like getting into life after playing, there's, um, you, you never know exactly what direction you're going to go in and do you want to do front office stuff, but you know, you, the, the closer you get to the front office, the, the further you away from the field and the competition and, and it gives you being on the field, gives you that connection with the players. That's amazing. And, um, you know, I, I've never missed playing. And part of that is because I'm still in the game and I'm, I'm still around the players and I get to help be a part of something special. Fantastic. So when, when you have a 162 game season, you're inevitably going to have guys who are, go through slumps. Uh, and so uh, again, I, I love to, that you've got your psychology background because I think that that can play into helping those guys through that and just getting them to understand, you know, what's important and what's not, but what's your process in helping, you know, uh, Joey bag of donuts, player X or whatever, uh, through these slumps and, and then how do you, how do you, how are you an advocate for them during that time? Because man, it's, uh, I, I've, I never went through it in 162 game season. So I can only imagine uh, the ups and downs that go through that. And so you can, you came from that and you understand what that grind looks like. So I think that you also have some empathy towards that, that I wouldn't have as a coach. Uh, but what would your advice be for us coaches who are who want to help those guys without, um, I guess, what would be the right way to go about that? Mm -hmm. Well, understanding the player for for one. And um, let's see a couple of stories early in my, my first year coaching and I was around a coach, uh, I'd say an old school coach and uh, and we're dealing with Latin players. And he goes, I just don't understand why are those still damn loud and all that, you know, and, and um, so I don't fully get uh, the Cuban culture, but I feel I'm married to a Cuban about 98% of the culture I understand and why they do the things they do. And I think the faster you can understand that, the more we can help the player. Sure. You have to understand they are from a different culture, are from a different background. So from the psychology side, like Americans, you know, what do you do when you, you meet somebody, you, you stick your hand out to shake their hand. So you're basically getting as far away from that person as you can. Latin, you, you greet somebody, you don't even know them, you hug them, you kiss them. Like it's a very passionate culture. So the faster, you know, dealing with players like Yasiel Puig and, and understand where this passion comes from and his background and how he almost lost his life to get here. And that can help you relate with that player. Um, I had a great, great story from a guy named Lucas Jaden from, uh, this is a, 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 a couple of guys I've been working with from train to be clutch that I thought it was a fascinating story about a player, um, who was just really scuffling, really just, just, and, and ends up getting DFA gets released, goes over to another team and just tears it up and they go play this team. And two of the coaches were talking like, like what got into this, what got into this player? And, and uh, it's like, he's been amazing for us. And he goes, Oh, ever since the, uh, the incident, he's, you know, he got some help with that. And he's been a better player. And they're like, what happened? And he goes, Oh, you didn't know his mom was sick. So from that, like understanding the player, like this guy was struggling because of something off the field, but this first previous team didn't do their homework to find out what was going on uh, off the field. So it's amazing when, when you can work and, 
and be on the same page and communicate with players and staff members how uh, it makes life a lot easier. Right. And, and again, the, the better we know the, the person and where they come from, the better we can motivate them and, and the better we can empathize with them, the better relationship that we can have with them because, you know, we, we want to be consistent, but I, I think the old saying was uh, you want to treat everybody the same. And I, I just, I don't agree with that. Like <laughs> we can't yeah. treat everybody exactly the same because everybody's story is so different. And I'm going through a book now and it's called uh, behave. I'll, I'll have to send it to you. Maybe you've, maybe you've read it, but a friend of mine sent it and it's like, it is just basically the size of the Bible. I mean, it is huge, but it goes through different, like it, it essentially takes us through how the brain is wired based on, uh, there was a couple of chapters of DNA and now it's getting into like the culture aspect of, of just how your culture shapes your behavior. And it is so fascinating because it's like, okay, here we do this here in America and in East Asia, they do this. And in, in the Latin countries, they do this. And it's just like, it's, it's been so many light bulb moments for me. And I'm like, man, I thought that that was a sign of being rude or I said something to this player and they took it as rude and I didn't mean that. And it's like, okay, now that all of that makes sense. And it's just, it's to yeah. your point, I, I think that getting to know those guys and, and getting to know our players truly in and out as, as much as we can, uh, can only help them and can help us. And I think that that's the fun part of coaching. And, I, and when, when people get out of sports and they get out of coaching in general, that's the part that they miss the most. And so, um, another thing that, that you, you've gotten to be around some great teams. And so one thing that I always like to ask is, is really what separates great teams like world series contenders every single year like you guys are with the dodgers the last several years uh from from teams that don't quite make it and let's say sans talent like let's take that out and and because obviously you've got to be talented to win but what separates the teams that get to the world series versus maybe some of the most talented teams in the regular season that don't I would, I mean, what just jumps out to me is a bunch of selfless players with the common goal to, you know, to do something special. Like, um, you know, like even we, we talk about running the bases and Chase Utley made a great, great uh, uh, little speech in a, in a hitters meeting and, and Seeger followed up a year later. Like, you know, I like to think of running the bases, not for yourself, but you run the bases for your teammates. And that's what the type of team and players you're looking for, where, you know, you got a sure double, possible triple, you turn into a triple, and now you're sitting over there with less than two outs, you got an RBI for your teammate, or you advance to third, you know, like all the different scenarios that you can do to help your teammate out. And, you know, you beat out a double play, now and the next guy comes up and has a chance to drive in a run or extend the inning. So every play matters, you know, like, um, you know, it could be a, nine to one ball game and do we keep pounding it on them yeah you keep pounding it on them you know why because now they might have to send down a guy and call up somebody else and it just changes the whole dynamic of a series it's not like you're playing one game you're playing them for three four four games at a time mm -hmm. so um i got a little off topic there but just talking about the, the 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 team and what makes them the the difference and the really good ones and they just care about the right reasons. They, they eliminate the distractions and, and, and really focus on winning. I love that. Is that something that we as coaches can help with, or is that like getting the right group of players together at the same time in their careers? Cause it seems like it's, it's, it's so hard to, to win back to back. Like you look at the Yankees in, in the early, like the early two thousands, late nineties that they went through a string of really good teams and the Red Sox uh, won a couple, the Giants won a couple and they had a, a same core group of players, but every year is different because you have, let's say, you know, one of the Dodgers leaves next year, then that's going to fill a void in, in, in player X. And then somebody has to fill that role. And then it's just, it's so interesting how all the different puzzle pieces have to truly come together to get to a world series. So I guess my question is, is how, how can we as coaches do our best to try and promote that selflessness? Uh, and, and especially in such a selfish game that baseball is because we want to get hits and we want to get paid and all of that's okay. Like all of that, I, I'm, I will never get onto a player for saying, Hey, I want to get to the big league so I can make a league minimum so I can take care of my family the rest of my life. Like that's not, that, that's just his why. And so how do we help 
get the players to understand that, but also within the team concept. I mean, part, it'll start with our actions, you know, what we do and how we go about living our life. And, um, and I think you can win with the, the selfish player. I get, I mean, there's a ton of players that are selfish and that's, that's what's made them really good. But, but um, I, I, I guess, um, you know, getting, getting these players to, to buy in, it, it stems from, uh, we need to preach about the process, keep them on track with the process we're trying to, uh, to, to, you know, it's, if we're going up there with the right process, the consistent, that's all we can do. And like we talk, I mean, you hear it all the time, control the controllables. Like those are the things we can control. Um, like you think of managers today, it's, it's about like communicating, communicating with these players and, and, and doing their best job to get them to go out and perform every night. You know, it's not as much about the X's and O's. We have a ton of help with the X's and O's. You know, we meet before every game and talk about our best matchups. And then uh, you either use those matchups or you're going to go with your gut and, and, and kind of feel things out. But finding a way to get these guys motivated and eliminate these distractions um, and break it down. And, and sometimes it's just listening to the player. You know, they might be in an argument with a girlfriend and you kind of kind of talk them off the ledge and, and uh, maybe that one little bit of advice and, and being able to relate with them. I think, what helps me uh, is, you know, I played for a long time. I, I, I've, I've been in almost, I shouldn't say almost, I've been in a lot of the situations that our players have been in. I've been, um, and, and I, I will never, I think they understand, I'll never think this game is easy. It's, I, I consider myself as elite of an athlete as there is, and this is the most difficult thing that I've ever done. Oh, definitely. And and I think, you know, sometimes, and I've been so guilty of this too, of the further we get away from playing, the the less we remember about how hard it was to friggin' play. And it's like, okay, it was so hard that it literally pushed me out of the game. So I need, <laughs> I need to remember <laughs> that. But I've, uh, I've got some quick hitters here before you go. And, and hey, before we, John, before you jump on that one, let me, uh, so Bob Guerin, who I've, I've learned a ton from our, our bench coach and, and manager of Oakland A's, but, uh, he said, there's so many players that, that step away from the game and it just like, they don't understand. It, it seems so easy because, you know, Bob's like, the further I get away from the game, the, 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 the more excited I am about my career because I realize how difficult the game really, <laughs> really was. So it's I like, uh, I, I'm more excited about my accomplishments mm -hmm. uh, as a player when you look back on it. No, that's great. Yeah. And, and then I'm looking like, so lately I've been watching all of the eighties and nineties. And, and again, my, the, the listeners know my dad played in, in the sixties and the se early seventies. Uh, and so I grew up with stories like Clemente and Stargell and, and we always have arguments about, you know, how good Mike Trout is. And, and he's, you know, he was a big Mickey Mantle fan growing up. And, and so, and then looking back at those games and then seeing the guys playing today and I'm like, man, these guys are freaking good. <laughs> Like they're so much bigger and stronger and, and it's just, it's, it's interesting. So I, I, I rib him all the time about that, but that's, that's a great point. And I love that story. Yeah. It's uh, the athletes are just so big and strong. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, we hear all the, the, I don't even want to probably don't want to touch this subject, but the Michael Jordan, LeBron, and you look at the size of like LeBron's almost playing in a different weight class. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, than Michael Jordan and, and the things that he can do at his size are just amazing. Oh, dude, regardless of whether he's the greatest basketball player of all time, you may be the greatest athlete of all time because that dude, yeah. he's something else. Uh, but but I do have some quick kiddos before you go. I know you, you've got some some kiddos to, to go entertain since they're out of school now. But uh, what's something that you've learned lately that's gotten you really excited? Well, I couldn't be more excited uh, to tell my story. And and if I, I don't want to like – I shouldn't say promote, but Train to Be Clutch is a group. Uh, Lucas Jaden, who I've worked with, who's worked with a couple of players, works with a ton of athletes, uh, and Joshua Medcalf, who wrote the book Chop Wood, Carry Water. So I highly Great recommend book. this book for a number of people. It teaches a lot of life lessons. I'm doing it with my kids where we'll listen to a chapter, and then I'll make the kids tell me something they learned about the chapter. But I reached out to Joshua, who wrote the book, and then he put me in contact with Lucas and um, I, I wanted to be, a, to be a better speaker. So you might hear me talk. It's, it's definitely not my comfort zone. And, um, I've taken these last seven weeks to kind of write my story. And that's kind of where I put this together. And, and, and now I've, my, one of my homework assignments was to go out and tell it more. 
So uh, I think I spoke for about 15 minutes telling my story. The first time I told that story, it was four minutes long. And uh, I even, I was telling it to my best friend and I got locked up, I got stuck. So uh, something that makes me excited is I, I've been able to tell a story and I think a, uh, a pretty clean version of it and, and do it in 15 minutes and express uh, some of the things my mom believed in and some of the things I believe in. Well, I know I may be the first to say this, but I won't be the last. If Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because uh, again, it's the only word that comes to mind whenever I, whenever I was hearing that, which is powerful. And, and I mean, I, I don't say that just to toot your horn, but I think that that's, that's such a cool reminder of, of just the different things that people go through and the impact that we can have as coaches and individuals on not only one person, but just the world too. And it's, it, it is really neat. So thank you again for, for sharing that. Uh, what is something that you do in training or practice? It could be spring training or the off season or just what is something that you know that whenever you say, hey, guys, we're doing this today, your players love it? Um, they probably get too sick of hearing my voice. And um, there's a couple drills that I think they enjoy where it usually involves less running. Uh, where we kind of, as a coach, you've got to get as creative as possible. That's another thing I've done over this last seven weeks. I've tried to like research every drill and kind of come up with new things. And um, like my wife plays tennis, so I got a bunch of tennis balls and a tennis racket and I'm, I'm taking players out there and my boys and just, you know, hey, you got 40 balls right here. I'm going to hit them at different paces to you up in the air on the ground. You just got to catch everyone clean. and. Um, the least amount of drops, the, you know, who wins. So just trying to get creative uh, with drills and, and, uh, and make it fun for the players. We do a competition where you got have uh, three different teams of three guys. And uh, the first time you're through, I, I have a machine, I'm, I'm dropping three balls and they got to communicate and catch all three for that next time. I'm dropping four balls for the three players. The next time, five balls, six balls. And then you kind of see how long you can go before, someone drops so they got to catch kind of move around and catch the next one and you have a team doing it so uh like i said uh, you know you're always thinking with this uh this mindset of finding ways to get them better mm -hmm. i love that what is your biggest coaching pet peeve uh biggest coaching pet peeve um I, when i think of with players like my biggest thing is posting like we, we want you to be accountable and to post every day. And part of that is our job to, to get these players to buy into this 116, 162 game season plus playoffs, plus spring training. So the effort level, I think, is what really drives coaches crazy when they see the lack of effort from a player. And um, now I have learned to my in throughout my career as a coach and that there are times when guys need to back you know, back it down to keep this guy on the field and understand, um, you know, the responsibilities of, of keeping that guy on the field. I do. There's another one that bothers me is uh, I learned from Joe Torre is, is missing first base. So a guy, it's a kind of routine out and they're, they're running through first base and they drag their toe. Over, I mean, and they just step over the bag. Like, like you just don't understand it. And why would you ever uh, run all the way down there and miss, first base and if that first baseman misses the ball now he just goes and picks it up and touches the base you're still out so <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good point yeah. uh let's see what the next one would be what is something that you failed at lately that you don't mind sharing that i uh, that i failed at that you failed oh, at well lately. i mean just what jumps out of my mind is telling telling my story and it's like it's not a comfortable thing like i'm sitting here talking to um Oh, you know, one of my closest friends and I'm stuck on my words and, and he has a, a little bit of a psychology background and he kind of worked me through it. And it was when I finished, I was actually like, I, I was pissed that I'd spent all this time and I'd told it to myself so many times and I got stuck telling it to him. But I was like, you know, this is a good thing because it, it shows me that I need to continue to practice it. And it shows me how I did get through it, even though it wasn't as good as I liked it. And, um, uh, and then uh, these last two times I've told her, just every time I've almost, I've gotten better at it. So, um, and then once you say it over and over again, you find different ways to kind of add in, what, depending on what what audience you're speaking to, and 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 just tell it. It's a real story, and I'm a real person, and I've been through this stuff, and it's 
and it's why I am the person that I am. I love it. And then finally, uh, I'm, I'm going to include train to be clutch and then chop wood, carry water in the resources section. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add as far as books or courses or just anything that you've dug into lately or uh, in the past that, is, that has really shaped your coaching career? John Gordon has been great energy bus. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see this is his, his uh, stay positive shirt that he sent us a few years ago during the playoffs. Um, the book Legacy, the the All Blacks. I don't know the rugby team, New Zealand rugby team is a great uh, book about getting guys to buy in. They don't care how elite you are uh, as a player if you don't buy into their philosophies. And it's it's the winningest franchise in all of sports, I believe. And um, you talk about a bunch of badasses. It's pre it's pretty intense book and. Um, I've been on the, the David Goggins, uh, I've kind of done, listened to a lot of his podcasts and his books. If you want an intense book to, to read, um, um, was it pound the stone is one by Joshua, uh, Medcalf that I, I just got, and I need to, to kind of crack that open and read, but it's supposed to be, uh, he, he, he recommended that more than chop wood carry water for, for what I do. So I'm looking forward it's to fantastic. That. Yeah, I, I love, uh, and then with, with John Gordon and Joshua, uh, a lot of them are fables too, which I think yeah. players would like. So if you're, a, if you're a player, I definitely recommend uh, uh, like trying those out uh, because I know as a player I did not want to read, but if I had read probably those, <laughs> I think it would be really good. And then, man, Goggins is something else, man. Yeah. I, I, there were so many people who recommended his book and I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if, if I don't really like, you know. And so I finally did read it. And it was like, punch me in the face, Goggins. Like, you are a badass. Like, literally the hardest man alive, potentially. And, and so I did. Did you read, I, I think it's, did you read Training with the Seal? Where the, that, he, that was mm -hmm. the first book. And I didn't know who David Goggins was. And so, um, God, what's his name? He's a very wealthy his wife, uh, I can't think of his name right now, started Spanx, and they've been very successful business people. But uh, he hired, he saw this guy, uh, he was doing these ultra, mar like a ultra marathon, but with like a relay. So there's like seven people running them. And, and he gets out there and he goes, most of these guys are white, skinny, tiny guys. Mm -hmm. And he looks up and sees this one black guy that was 220 pounds. And he's like, he had a different look on his face. Like, like he was just on a mission and then he realized like, who is that guy? And they're like, you don't know who that is. That's uh, Navy SEAL David Goggins. And he was doing this 120 mile run by himself. <laughs> so everyone, everyone's out there doing a relay where they're running like seven miles at a time. And the story is amazing where he's, he, you know, urinates on him. He shits on himself. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and he finishes, uh, he collapses at like mile 70 and he, finds a way to, to, to fight, to get through this, to be able to raise money for fallen, uh, the kids of fallen soldiers. Man, that's, that's nuts. No, I haven't read it all. I have to add that to the list. I do know. So we were, we were in spring training. <clears throat> One of our trainers is a, uh, he, he was with the seals. He wasn't a yeah. seal, but he, but he was a doctor or a trainer with the seals when Goggins was, was going through there. And so I kept asking him about, like all the stories that I was reading about on a daily basis, I was probably annoying him. I was like, Hey, did Goggins really do this? And he was like, that dude is, is, is built different. Like in, in a, yeah. in a school of people built different, he was built different. So it was pretty cool. And we'll have to share some, some stories about that. Cause I don't know if, if they would be appropriate for the podcast, but, uh, but George, I, I appreciate your time. And man, I, I know that, uh, we actually like have had like four takes today based on internet and my stupidity of, of hitting the computer at the wrong button. So uh, I appreciate your resourcefulness and your ability to do what your shirt says and stay positive. But, uh, I do appreciate your time and, and I know that, that this will get some great feedback, but is there a way that listeners can get in contact with you if they had any questions or, or just anywhere online that they can go to, you know, <laughs> to talk with you or, or find more about you. I, I'm laughing because uh, I'm, a, I'm a first time Twitter guy and my wife helped me set up an account a couple days nice. ago. And I, I, I don't even know if I'm, it's, it was George Lombard senior maybe, or, or something like, something like that. But I, I'm sure you can find me on Twitter and uh, uh, find it, put it in the show notes. Yeah. That, yeah. So that'd be great. And uh, 
like, you know, obviously I, I want it for the news and also to be able to, to learn things and kind of stay up to times uh, in today's society. Cool. I'm going to open up the mic for you and just give you full reign. Uh, talk about whatever you want, but is, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? No, I just, my, my biggest, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and share my story. And thank you so much. I just met you through uh, Sean Larkin, who works for the Dodgers, another tremendous person. And, uh, and knowing Sean, uh, people that he's friends with, it's another uh, tremendous person in yourself. So thank you for having me.